that the best sprinters, the best athletes, like when you look at like Ronaldo and Messi, the probably the reason Messi is Messi is because Ronaldo existed. Yeah. If Ronaldo didn't exist, Messi probably wouldn't have reached like as high as he has and as because he wouldn't have that person pushing him to keep going all the time. Yeah. I think that's something you've got to think about in business. In all areas of our life, we compromise. In, you know, in an ideal world, I might say I'm going to drive around you know, a Rolls Royce Cullinan. But there's, I'd say, look, I'd love that car. However, it's not viable for me right now. Kazi, how does a young guy that's only 33 years old do 20 million pound of property in London? A um, little bit of stress, a little bit of stress, a lot of hard work, a um, lot of leveraging, you know, people that are around me, the experts to fill in the gaps that I didn't know um, and then really finding a niche, home in that and a lot of cookie cutters. So find something that works and repeat because there's so much property out there, you know, that you can just kind of repeat what you do when you find a strategy that works. And do you think it's possible to repeat that now for somebody, let's say somebody starting out now in the late 20s in London, do you think they can replicate what you've done or? I think in terms of numbers wise, they can replicate, they can by far exceed it because people always look at things to say that okay you know what 50 years ago property prices were this cheap um this many years ago there was this and there's always a reason you know we look back and say i wish i had that but a lot of the people you know like even myself look forward and say well we wish we had some of the opportunities that you have at your disposal so i for example being able to leverage you know that um using other people's money is way more like you know viable and, and known about you know rent to rent these strategies of lower barriers to entry the the fact that you have an ability to build a personal brand you know through the platforms like instagram youtube yes. tiktok etc how important do you think that uh that brand is these days a social media presence are you very visible online and and kind of that's how we kind of first bumped into each other online i think, I think what it is is like you know branding is effectively like a type of capital so, for example, you have to look at what you have at your disposal. If you don't have the capital potentially to start out, what else do you have to offer? Um, and what a brand does is allows people to see the value in you, see what you've done, see what, you know, what drives you, what makes you tick, what makes you good, um, what makes you credible. It's effectively your shop window. And if you can market yourself without a massive marketing budget, it's just a USP that you can use to pitch to a potential investor, JV partner, or somebody else that you want to work alongside. I think that's a great way of putting it because um, it's a level playing field for everybody. And the way I tend to think about it and have thought about it for a long time is that ultimately we know people do business with people they get to know, like, and right. trust. And what the social media platforms allow you to do is for people to get to know, mm -hmm. like, and trust you remotely before they ever meet you. Exactly. If they, they already kind of feel a sense of they they, they know you. And I, and I think that's such an important way to be able to to build that presence because as you said it's it's not that you do everything on your own it's about people around you mm -hmm. they could be uh, professionals that you use for services it could be uh, investors it could be even somebody looking to sell a property as well exactly and i think you know in terms of that no like and trust when people first start out and they say you know i'm trying to do business i'm trying to raise investment whatever it is that you're looking for one of the things that you'll find whether it's myself sad or loads of other people saying is it will be the people that have a relationship with your friends and family going to be the first people that believe and buy into what you're selling. But building a good social media brand means it it's not just friends and family that have that awareness of yeah. you and believe in who you are, your, you know, credibility, your values, etc. So effectively it just gives you, you know, I guess that is would be like a wider pool to fish in. Mm -hmm. What do you think the opportunities are in, in London at the moment in the market? Because we, we had an interesting conversation before and you were saying, I was just driving up here and I see building everywhere that yeah. independently. And I was saying that we can sometimes become blind to what's around us. And when you're traveling to somewhere different, you see things you don't see ordinarily. And sometimes those that are already in London thinking, oh, it's too late. I can't get into the market. How can I start? Where do you see that opportunity? So, I mean, I guess in terms of sort of two questions, one, how do you start and what are the opportunities in London? You know, downside of London is it's super expensive. I'm not going to lie. London is very expensive. If you were to look at the stats, it's probably in the top five most expensive, you know, cities to live in, most desirable places to live. We're on a small island, finite amount of space, massive amount of demand. So prices are expensive. That's the downside. The upside of that is that because we're so concentrated, it means that ceiling prices are always going up. 
So in terms of adding value, if you can create a product that's super desirable, mm -hmm. you can create a product that, you know, you think about what does my target market look like? Mm -hmm. You know, who is going to buy this product? You can push up their Zen values or your, your GDVs, your gross development values. Um, because it's like, you know, central London, we say it's very straightforward. It's, you know, it's like a dartboard, zone yeah. one in the middle, and then it spreads out, you know, from that nucleus. So if somebody's, and again, I'm, I'm talking very London because I'm a Londoner, I'm a South Londoner. So if somebody, for example, can't afford to buy in Chelsea, they go to Fulham. If they can't afford Fulham, they go to Batty, they can't. And, but those people still have that same budget for a little bit further. Yeah. So if you are creating great products, you can tend to, you know, really push the ceiling prices and those ele the, the envelope values of what you're trying to produce. In terms of specific strategies for somebody, you know, starting out in London, it depends if you want to start out straight away, if you have the capital or the connections and you know, start in development. But the Airbnb model, rent to rent is really strong. You know, the demand's crazy. I think my occupancy at the moment is like in the 90 plus percentile across all the properties that we have on, which would, you know, isn't normal for, you know, a serviced accommodation model. Um, the one to two bedroom conversion, which is like a strategy that I teach with mm -hmm. people is effectively taking properties that are one bed properties, generally speaking in your Edwardian, Victorian, Lardale property that were converted, you know, a long time ago, typical masonettes, quite undesirable layouts. Maybe you've got a separate kitchen that you go through the kitchen to get to the bathroom, a large lounge, a second bedroom. You make the kitchen, you know, more of your modern, so you make the, the large lounge more of your modern open plan kitchen living room. You know, you then turn the additional, um, the kitchen into the additional bedroom and now you've got a two bed. So not only are you pushing the price up because you refurbished it, but adding that extra bedroom is maybe adding, you know, 15% to the actual yeah. price of the property, even though the square footage is staying the same. Yeah. That's really important that I think what you've just shared there. Um, when I first started in uh, property, a lot of the people I was looking at that was, for example, flipping, that would be, you just buy something that's tired, you pay everything magnolia, you fit a standard kitchen, a standard bathroom, and that's it. Mm -hmm. That's all, and new windows, central heating, that was yeah. it. And it was like, a, you, if you walked into any one of those properties, there was no way of telling who renovated it because they all looked the same. But that was the model. But by understanding, actually, uh, you know, you can create something for a market and understanding what that market's needs are, you can actually create much more profit. You can create a premium mm -hmm. product. Um, and you don't have to be the most expensive area, but you can create a desirable product that people want. Exactly. And that also is intrinsically linked to your branding if you're known for a high quality like that's sort of my thing like okay yes we don't operate in the most the highest end areas in london but we create a luxury product so now when i finish in you know, a project and generally speaking a lot of the time i'm selling the flats on instagram because people know that okay they've seen this they follow it they're going through the transformation they're excited and i think you know that people want that high-end product and there's a demand for it um that you know it's not that we've created but we've noticed the demand that there is a requirement you service that requirement yeah it's uh, i remember seeing one of your first one of the first videos i saw of you online a few years ago and i saw a project that you're walking through and i was really impressed the quality the detail um and it's nice to see people paying attention to the detail and not just it's not just about the profit you create an amazing product you know you, you'll you'll make money and i mean you have to adapt to market conditions like for example your big house builders whether it be you know berkeley barrett's etc They've, over the last six years, you said it's no more magnolia, it's no more half bathroom tiled, half the way with a pedestal basin. Like the standards have gone up. And if you want to remain competitive, you have to adapt to the market. So I'm even looking at them now and I don't look at them to say like, oh, they've done it better. Like there's no room yeah. in the market for me. I look at them and I'm like, oh, okay, I see what you're doing. Like, how can we beat that? And I think that's the kind of attitude that you have to have. Not that, okay, if something happens, it means your business isn't now viable it's okay when there's competition use that competition to drive you forward like sprinters do you know yeah. if you get this time i'm going to push that the best sprinters the best athletes like when you look at like ronaldo and messi the probably the reason messi is messi is because ronaldo existed yeah. if Ren ronaldo didn't exist messi probably wouldn't have reached like as high as he has and as because he wouldn't have that person pushing him to keep going all the time yeah. i think that's something you've got to think about in business and with the London market, I guess one of the challenges people often uh, think about or talk about is the amount of international money. As you mm -hmm. mentioned, it's, it's literally London is like an international city. It, yeah. It's a place where people come and park their money mm -hmm. because it's a safe place to exactly, keep money. Yeah. They're not even thinking about what's my return. Mm -hmm. They're just thinking, it's my money is safe here. Exactly. If it's 1%, 2% returns, hey, they don't, they don't care. 
So how, how are you finding that uh, in the current market? Is that still the case? Or is that changing? Is a lot of international money I mean, in London? You know, there's, you know, obviously due to the political climate, um, fortunate circumstances, you know, in Ukraine and Russia, um, you know, s s certain constraints on specific areas investing, you have seen that some money hasn't come in in the same way because of uncertainty. Because like you mentioned, investment's always about risk and reward. Mm -hmm. If there's now precedent that there's risk on, you know, certain types of foreign investors' money, yes. it's not as rewarding. They're not going to invest. They'd look at areas, so which is one of the reasons why Dubai at the, ex at the moment is thriving because of restrictions, you know, on, on, on specific markets mm -hmm. that, you know, the money's being pulled instead because it seems a safer investment yeah. with an even better return. Um, that being said, London is small relatively, like demand is still there, not at the same level. I think across the board, like globally, there are concerns that, you know, people are tightening their belts in different areas. Um, but yeah, the, the demand is still there. So with regards to, uh, people that coming onto the housing mm. ladder now in London, for example, buying the first home. Mm. Do you see that it's now becoming mostly apartment based? So people are really the first home is an apartment, or there's still uh, a house being a first home for some people. I think I have this conversation a lot, maybe more than I'd like. But yeah, generally speaking, your first home in London, it, you know, unless you're super fortunate, is going to be an apartment. Is going to be a flat. It might even be a one bedroom flat, even though you feel like you need a two bedroom flat. It might not have a garden. It might be in a larger building than you would like. It might not be in the exact location that you would like. But the reality is the market is what the market is. You can't change it. So you're better off buying at an earlier stage. And in all areas of our life, we compromise. In, you know, in an ideal world, I might say I'm going to drive around, you know, a Rolls Royce Cullinan. But there's, I'd say, look, I'd love that car. However, it's not viable for me right now. Or even if it was... Or is like you know the trade-off of what i would lose out by buying that isn't worth me putting you know that much money over there and i think people have to have the same attitude because property as much as you have the emotional attachment of it, it's my home and it's what i want yeah it's an investment at the same time and it's i know it is hard a lot of the time because it is your home and i guess in an ideal world a home would be a home and a so a soul, a soul home that was would be what it would be but it's not so you know you do have to think financially about where you buy, um, you know, what you're going to buy for how much. Um, so yeah, most people, to ask your, answer your question, most people's first home isn't their home, but the reality is you transition. I think they say the average person, you know, buys, I think, four or five properties, you know, that lifestyle transitions between them before they find their forever home. So I don't think you need to be overly attached because yeah. <laughs> property is not the most liquid, but, you know, it's not forever. Yes. We were having this conversation early, actually, just before uh, uh, today uh, we're recording this um, with one of the guys in the office about uh, whether investors, uh, particularly in high value areas, mm. should own their home or whether they should be using their money for investments and they're renting their mm. home. So my thoughts on that are at a certain price point, it probably does make more sense to rent your home depending on the type of home you want. Yeah. I just to expand on that, sorry, just to, to interrupt you where so in some places very expensive homes will be cheaper to rent because there's less demand for them. Yeah. So you could, for example, the type of house that I could rent for and also the type of house that I could rent for five thousand pounds a month versus the type of house that I would buy, I'd probably get a lot more bang for my buck, like, you know, in the five thousand pound rental. Now I think there's always the trade off of okay, well, but then if you spend that additional money, like you said, on the nice car or the nice holidays, then you don't have your assets paying for your, your liabilities I, or your lifestyle, i.e. the rental. So if, for example, you're looking at a property that's going to cost 1.5 million, and it all depends on salary and things like that. But, you know, even if you've got a 60% loan to value, you know, you're, you're still going to have a pretty high mortgage. Like, you know, you're looking best part of four and a half thousand pounds a month. Which means, but outside of that, you've still got what that sixty percent. You've still got like you know seven seven hundred thousand pounds yeah. cash tied up. Now that seven hundred thousand pounds, like I'm sure if I was to ask you how much money could you make with seven hundred thousand pounds cash, it would be more than that rental amount. 
So it's that trade-off of you don't always have to own where you live. Mm. And I think it's something that people do need to familiarize themselves with more because we do have an attitude that an Englishman's home is his castle is something that was, was very common. And we have really high home ownership levels in, in, the, in the UK in comparison to the rest of Europe, which is great. But I don't think you necessarily have to own where you live. Yeah, we're definitely in a very unique market in this country because it says as soon as you, you cross the border and go over into France, Germany, place like this, there's, you know, most people rent. It's it's unusual for people to to own the home at the level of ownership it is in this in this country. So with the projects that you're doing, do you generally renovate and flip or do you uh, renovate and look to keep them in your portfolio for long-term rental? So my strategy has generally been to flip. Okay. So buy a property, spend some money, add some value, sell for a higher price and obviously pocket the, the profit after taxation. Um, now, obviously, the downside of that is the taxation. When you refinance, you, you don't obviously you pay that tax when you refinance. Um, but that being said, it's you know even if if you, for example, for argument's sake, you buy a property for um, five hundred thousand pounds, you spend two hundred thousand pounds all in, you know, with your fees, and you get it revalued at a million pounds for argument's sake now technically speaking that's one of our unicorn all money out deals because by the time you have a 75 percent loan to value you pull out some you know 750,000 which means you pay back the addition the the loan of 700 um and you're 50,000 pounds up and you've got an asset that's cash flowing but i think what people miss sometimes is that although it's not your money that's inside it's still 250,000 pounds that could be earning you money and because yields aren't as high in london as they are in the Midlands or in you know the north of England or other places around the UK, it's not always the best thing to do. Mm-hmm. So generally speaking, I would be guided by the market. Yeah. So I'm more than happy, like my goal would be to sell. But if, for example, you know, the rental market, which has boomed at the moment and the premiums meant that it made sense and it presented, you know, a good return on investment, and I, I do keep and I have built a portfolio over time. Um, But I try and build a specific portfolio more than because what what I generally do, and I think we've spoken about off camera, is like residential conversions, which don't necessarily yield the level of income that would make sense leaving in the amount of capital based on the value of the properties in London. That being said, with the Airbnb model serviced accommodation, there has been multipliers on those which do make it more efficient. Um, But I think, yeah, I'm just guided by, look, if I finish a project and at the end of it, (laughs) Um, you know, uh, I was to, to market it at 500,000, um, and I wasn't, you know, the best offer I was getting was 450, mm-hmm. but the bank was saying, yeah, they'll let me refinance at 500. I'm probably going to refinance because that's what the market has determined. Yeah. So when you're, when you're doing that, do you, uh, from the offset, mm-hmm. cause we were talking about creating a product for mm-hmm. a certain type of clientele. Do you then create the product in a way where it's generic, where it can actually work for rental and work for sale? So, or because the way I tend to do it, when we're building for sale, we're selling. Mm-hmm. You know, because we're putting high end stuff in the property. You know, if you're putting granite work, Tom, I'm, I'm not putting that in a rental. You know, my thing is, I think sometimes I'm a bit of an emotional investor. Yeah. In I like a nice finish. So whether or not you know, it's because I generally build to sell. Yeah. However. I'm more than happy to know that, you know, if I've created a great product, whether or not the the end user is somebody renting or somebody buying, that the type of tenant that you attract for a really good product at a premium, you know, is amazing. And as, yeah. as we mentioned, like there's loads of people, for example, that that product is their equivalent of that's my amazing home. Mm-hmm. They maybe they still own somewhere else, but they want to rent in a specific yeah. area and that makes sense for them. And, you know, with the rental market, the way it is now, people are almost having to send CVs to rent properties. Yeah. So the standard of tenant that you can get, you know, we've got tenants that, I've got tenants that have been with me for eight years plus, and I'm talking about booming for eight years plus in HMOs, and the room still looks the same way it does when we, you know, we finished a refurbishment. Yes. So I think, yes, you do, like on a, on a larger scale, you've got to, you know, kind of make sure there's a different standard towards rental, particularly maybe in the student market and other spaces. But, you know, I think in London, we do have the luxury that if you do have that due diligence, the in-house management, maintenance, you can create a product that, you know, even if you rent it for two years and you sell it two years later, three, four, five years later, you've still got a really good product at the end of it. And do you tend to standardize the uh, renovations or do you like have a cookie cutter approach as a case of 
we just kind of pick up and 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 use that method or hmo wise yes like it's pretty standardized in terms of room sizes bathrooms fit out of you know the second fix materials yeah. um so all of our m e products um flat conversions and not so much okay like I, I generally would kind of put together a design brief at the beginning like I'm a man that spends a lot of time on your Pinterest and a lot of time on Instagram, seeing other people's projects. And I'll look at things and I'll be like, okay, that's that's cool. I can see how we can replicate that in this yeah. space. And I think that's almost where my passion is as well. That's where the fun comes in. Because if you spend all your time looking at like, you know, a freshly plastered wall, it gets very generic very quickly. So having something to look forward to, like, you know, you're saying, okay, we've got out of ground okay you know the partitions are up first fix is in now we're plastered now i know okay great plaster is drying we can get some paint on the walls can start to think about you know that we'll start to see the second fix i think that's where the impetus to spur you on after maybe you've had a little bit of headache on the build or a little bit of problems it can kind of keep you going as well so talking of headaches with projects and builders has it been a smooth journey or you've had challenges with uh, builders along the way I, I, I would say i've been you know, in terms of challenges, I would say more so in terms of hindsight, there's certain builders that standards weren't, they weren't bad builders. They were just maybe slightly underqualified for, you know, some of the things, maybe I'm using multi-trades on stuff that I should have got yeah. specialists on earlier on and earlier projects. I'd say naturally, and I always advise this to people, like when you are starting out, whether or not it's property investment or any type of investment entrepreneurship, do some self-analysis of what your own risk tolerances are yeah. and because i'm naturally quite risk adverse i've not necessarily had those big like like massive like oh my gosh moments because i try and mitigate risk as much as possible mm -hmm. that being said i've probably had a lot of moments where i've lost out on potential profits that could have been exponential because you know i, I prefer to play it a little bit bit safer be it like everybody you know i've i've had my moments some more like when i feel like i'm spending you know, 90% of my day being a secretary and have you turned up to work yet? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. Yes. Yes. I know your daughter's got school, but you do have work. You know, you've got like five other people waiting for you and you've got the keys. I know little things, but like I haven't, you know, I get a lot of the things that like in property as well, solving problems are where the money is. Yes. yes. So I might buy a building I know has got some issues and then it turns out it actually does have subsidence because it's got a co collapsed drain down the side. But I kind of knew I knew that buying it and it, so the problem you have the contingencies for and yes. you plan for. Yes. And after yeah. the bigger the problems, the bigger the profits and the less competition because yeah. yeah. people get frightened by problems. I, I completely agree. The more problematic a situation as long as you have a solution to it, yeah, then the bigger the uh, yeah. the reward will be. The reality is, there in in most cases, there's a problem. It's just how much is it? Is there, sorry, there's a solution to a yeah. problem. It's just how much is it going to cost you, yeah. and and does the cost make sense? And when the cost doesn't make sense, people kind of know that. And sometimes there's a workable solution, even when you're dealing with whether it be you know your Thames Waters mm -hmm. or your building control or all these other you know associated stakeholders. Generally speaking, like you know you're in the business of you pay fees to people everybody's making money yeah. so if you stop making money everybody stops making money so i think with a little bit of hard work and common sense you can generally you know find a solution now, when someone's starting out doing their first um, project for example and one way would be you appoint one builder mm -hmm. to do the whole project or it'd be roll up your sleeves and say right, i'm going to project manage mm -hmm. and bring the various trades in what's your views on somebody starting out how they should approach uh, a project i think and i feel that like sometimes a bit of a cop-out but I do say there's not a one size fits all to a, to a lot of questions. So apologies if you hear me uh, saying that uh, like three uh, times. Because some people come from a project management background. Yeah. They could be an IT project manager, transferable skills. Exactly. They could be an amazing communicator. They could have had a previous, you know, they could have worked previously somewhere in construction. You know, it could just naturally be something that comes naturally to them. Some people are super unorganized and, you know, that level of middle management that comes from having a project manager, which generally adds around a 20% premium, they could be not as efficient as that cost of 20%. Yeah. So I think let's say you took a ground and say, okay, you know what, it's going to cost me 20% more to complete this project with a project manager site form and however you want to see it. What is the trade-off for that? Like, mm -hmm. you know, so how, 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 what would be your, you know, ability to be able to complete that project? 
That being said, I do think there is a benefit in doing at least one because I'm not saying you have to roll up your sleeves and physically do the work, but to be able to be on site, to be able to create a process guide, you have to see what the processes are. To be able to see like a workflow of, okay, we do this, 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 and this order. Otherwise you're going to be shouting at your plaster, why have you not finished when your first fix of electrics haven't been done yet? So I think it's really important to understand it. And I think that goes for when you're growing, when you want to take on, if you want to take on a PA, a VA, a project manager, you it's difficult to delegate the work if you don't know what you're delegating. Yes. Yeah. It's that old saying about you don't know what you don't know at that stage. Yeah. If you're starting at its first project and you don't know mm -hmm. what to ask or what's the correct way to do it. Yeah. So earlier we touched on uh, buying, uh, refurbishing and refinancing or some people refer to the BRR type strategy. And, and we touched on the unicorn of getting all the money out of the house for free. In terms of uh, the, the market and where we are, do you think that type of strategy is possible in London where you're able to extract all your money out of a, a project? Because I'm guessing you mm. you need to be really doing 25% plus uplift yeah. in order to build the equity and to refinance, get the money out. Okay, so in terms of the current market, yes, it's possible. No, you're not going to do it on every deal. Or if you are, you're going to reduce the number of you do deals you can do drastically in relation to the level of capital that you have. You can, you know, make a lot of money in property in any market. If you took, you know, if you took the, the build up from after the first financial crash all the way up until, you know, 2017, because prices were going up, even if your deal wasn't amazing, if you held it for a little while, prices went up significantly and you made a lot more money. But there was a lot more competition when it was when you came to buy. In this current market, there are a lot more, unfortunately, duress sellers. So obviously, you know, unfortunately, but in, in where there is, you know, threats to the market, there's also opportunities. It means you can offer more bullishly when you are offering on properties, particularly if you're not an owner occupier and it is an investment for you. Um, so I think there's definitely an opportunity to negotiate further on your initial purchase price. And the first rule of property that everybody will teach you is you make your money when you buy yes. and you buy based on market conditions. I think for me, particularly in this market where, you know, despite subject to when this comes out, there was like, you know, prices went up for the first time in the last seven months, this month. Um, that being said, they are still quite stagnant. Mm -hmm. So for you to make money, you can't just rely on the market. You have to drive the value of that property up. Yeah. And a refurbishment alone probably isn't going to do that unless you get an amazing unicorn deal. However, if you have strategies that you can implement that you force the value of the property up. So I, we spoke about solving problems, whether they be structural, legal, defects on title, all of these things that other people are scared of. So you get the property significantly below market value. Mm -hmm. If you're able to get planning gains, so you're able to convert a house into multiple flats, a flat into multiple flats, you know, an airspace development, a commercial to residential, all of these things that the property had a, a value in its current condition and you increase the value um, with an element of expertise. So obviously you'd have to do that on schemes that, you know, are potentially either subject to planning or an unconditional offer as opposed to consented schemes yeah. where the value's already in place. But yeah, I mean, I've I've had probably in the last two years, done maybe three, three money out deals. So it's not loads, but it's, you know, enough. And one was a house where we identified that it actually had an established use to be two flats. One was a flat, that had a super messy title where, you know, it's, I think, you know, in terms of, yeah, it was just, yeah, Probably but we, pay for it. yeah, but we managed to clean it up and get that deal done. And one was a house of a problematic tenant taking on the problems of an ex existing tenant. Um, and, and they, so they, those ones they've been, there's been some issue mm -hmm. that you found a solution to. And before you purchased, you've gone into it knowing I can find a way to fix this rather than, okay, I found a problem property. I don't know how to fix it, but I'm buying yeah. it anyway. Like, or at least have an idea of the solution. You've yeah. got the start and then you're just pulling on some threads yeah. to make it, to make see the problem unravel. But I think definitely you can't just be like, oh, that problem's a property. Let me buy it. Because some, some problem might be there's an enforcement notice that means it's got to be knocked down. Yes. Like, you know, that's not solvable. So you do have to balance risk. Yeah, you don't want to uh, make somebody else's problem your problem. Exactly. You want that. a solution uh, exactly. to that. And... With uh, planners, what's been your experience of working with planners, getting planning approvals? Uh, 
understanding the council you're dealing with. Like council by council, planning is very different. You've got obviously your national planning standards and overriding, you know, what's expected and what's needed, but local councils have their own requirements. And even outside of planning, even like you do a lot of HMOs, like different councils have different room sizes. They may make additional licensing. It's so understanding the council that you're dealing with because you don't have an option to go and deal with a different council. So you need to know what they want and be able to satisfy them. I think some people want to make it a them versus us thing with planners, like, oh, I want to make this money and they don't want to see me make it. But if they're telling you what they want, find properties where that tick those boxes. So if, for example, I'm doing a residential conversion from a house into flats in, for example, the Croydon area, I know that they're going to want direct access to outdoor space, which means internal balconies. They don't want the balconies for overlooking. Right. If you're doing that same development, for example, in Southwark, I know that there's an option to do external balconies. If you know, for example, they way they want the amenity space, the parking, understanding day and night surveys, you know, understanding um, like public, like, um, local transport and things like that would allow you to be able to tick the boxes to get planning across. Some areas it's really slow and you have to base your finance on you know knowing how long it's going to take them to do it so i think really understanding what you're dealing with and you know acting accordingly sort of day one again i think that's really valuable just you know sharing that that it's not one method is going to work everywhere it's understanding local authorities will be different they could be neighboring authorities but they might have different views on what they want and how long they take and their expectations some areas for example like we say Lewisham and Bromley next door to each other neighboring areas Lewisham have basically got a we don't want any conversions like we've got an oversupply of flats because of large schemes from um, Berkeley and we've got an undersupply of family homes. So unless your house is falling down massive structure, which is we will not allow any conversions. Yeah. Bromley are completely different. Last like 12 months ago, Croydon Council were fine with, you know, demolition and new builds to create flats. Mm -hmm. They had a new, you know, new government. They went from being Labour to Conservative. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons they got voted in was on retaining family dwellings. Mm -hmm. So... I think understanding who you're dealing with, be it like having, you know, your ear to the ground in terms of what's going on, having conversations. That's the great thing about social media as well. Even if that's not necessarily your forte, you can be involved in communities or conversations, you know, where you can get this information without doing all of the legwork. Yeah. When someone is starting out and uh, in the early the journey, maybe in the twenties in, in London and we are looking at what's the right route for them. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, buying uh, and starting to build a portfolio or, or flipping properties on will be the, the route that people should think about as a starting point? So the first question, like the first thing I always say when people ask me this is, what do you want out of property? Yes. Like, because the reality is, if you want cash flow, you're not going to make any money from flipping property because you're going to constantly be turning it, turning it over, building you know, your, your cash pot. It like likewise, if you want long-term capital appreciation, flipping properties, you're going to be selling assets on. Um, so I think it's what do you want out of property? And and the downside of that is if you ask somebody what do you want, cash flow or capital appreciation, they're always going to say both. Yes. And there are strategies that are going to try and get both, but they're going to be yeah, fewer and far between. So I think it's working out what you want and then deciding, picking a strategy based on what you want. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I always say you need to start with the end in mind. You start with the outcome. What's the outcome you want to achieve? And then work backwards from that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people get sucked into the BRR strategy as a uh, as a cash flow strategy that you're going to make an income, you're going to give up your day job. Where actually, like just we were talking about it now, um, if you're doing a BRR where you're buying, renovating, yes, even if you've got most of your money out or all your money or you've got a little bit tied up, your cash flow is going to be probably quite small on that. And your money is now tied up or you some of it's tied up. So how are you going to transition from there into giving up your day job? It's going to be much more difficult. And uh, if you're flipping property, yeah, it's not going to give you uh, cash flow each mm -hmm. month, but you'll be able to build up a, a pot of cash. So yeah, just understanding what you want before you start. And I think it sounds difficult, but creating a plan based on what you currently have and what you think is realistic to achieve. Yeah. So work it backwards. Like, so for example, if you think, okay, this is, you know, where I want to get to and what my trajectory looks like, you know, it, it does that make sense for you? Yeah. Because if, for example, you could sit down and educate somebody all about... BRR and you know that realistically it's realistic for them to have let's say for argument say three houses in three years they can maybe do way more but just for example person x if that three houses in three years is only giving them an income of a thousand pounds a month yeah. and they're currently on a job that's giving them two and a half thousand that maybe isn't a viable strategy for them in terms of achieving their end goals 
So I think understanding what you want will determine what you do. Mm. And in property, there's so many different ways to make money. Mm. And I think people very easily get distracted. Oh, I want to do this because they've seen this person doing well, as opposed to actually, is that going to be the right thing uh, for them to be doing? And it, there's a lot of associated things you can do in properties. So even like we, we speak about, you know, the, we're on your podcast today. Um, you know, some people that want to get into property, they have a super, they have really keen interest, but don't necessarily have the capital to get into it in the way they want to. And typically we'd say, okay, you can do rent to rent, you can do deal sourcing, you can maybe do option agreements. But then there's also people that are creating their whole brand around property that are doing, you know, amazing brand deals and yeah. getting paid a lot of money. So it's chicken and egg. Sometimes you can make the money from things associated to property and then reinvest that later down the line. It's a huge industry property and there's so many services that service the property industry as well. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about some of the projects you're currently doing at the moment. So... The one I've kind of been, so I've, I finished a commercial to residential conversion. Mm -hmm. It was just um, office of uppers, converted the uppers into a flat. Okay. Good numbers on it in terms of back, it's working really well as an Airbnb. Um, you know, had a lot of help from my, my PA to systemize that, you know, and, and get that on board with the other stuff that's worked well. Um, probably the one I've been posting about most is my residential conversion of the two flats. Okay um that's it's a house into two flats bought it as a repossession it was you know being used illegally as a, a cannabis factory so obviously a lot of works in terms of restoring it it was just a rear um side return extension but because of changes in part l which is your you know insulations and things like that um you know things that building we regulations, building actually. regs exactly that where we thought okay you know what the staircase is going to be wide enough because we've got to get that extra layer of insulation You've now got to move that wall a little bit. Now, moving that wall isn't just a little partition wall because it's supporting the stairs. There's a spine wall. That's an extra two steels and a post. And I think, you know, a lot of people look at, like, renovations and conversions, like, you know, in comparison to new builds, they're quite easy. But there's so many more what-if factors because these are 100-year-old buildings and you're trying to reconfigure them to work in the way you want them to work. But it's been interesting. It's been good. Had a really good build team on that. Um, Imperial Construction have been great. So I always make sure the people that I'm working alongside, I give them their credits. The architects, AA Drafting, again, have been amazing. Um, that was purchased for like 650 Hoping to kind of hit a GDV of about $1.1 million. Um, for that one, property should be coming on the market in the next sort of four to eight weeks, sort of timelines permitting. Um got planning bought a consented flat that has plans to another flat in the loft for a business partner um that so yeah that's just a flat and then the, the the loft space is becoming an additional unit um again was fully consented but had a few issues being it was share of freehold okay and people think oh, i share a freehold it means i own it i can do what i want but i actually sometimes run away from share of freehold because it means the person who has to sign your stuff off lives in the building yeah. and nobody wants to they build a build inside no one wants to build inside <laughs> like so they've got every reason and also because they're not institutions they kind of make decisions based More on emotion. based on feeling and emotion and well i want this and we've got we've got to the end of it now on the bottom of things and yeah. so that kick off on that just started on the four flats um as well that's a house into four flats that was long time coming it's going back on four through planning, um, but that's good. And then got planning on a recent uh, scheme as well for two new build bungalows. Yeah. So starting on that very shortly and then got a few things going through planning. So you normally have a number of deals. You do that only one moment in time. Got yeah. pipeline building up as well. Yeah. It's good. So yeah, pipeline is, I think, for growth, pipeline yeah. is important because the sign of a good property developer mm -hmm. is one who's broke like whose yeah. bank is empty yeah. like if you're sitting with money in your account waiting for your next yeah. deal you're probably not doing the best and it sounds backwards but you know that that's what it is so you, you should be out there looking for these deals all the time yeah. you should be spotted these gems as they come up so and it's out like your yeah, family will complain and stuff like that that it's like ah oh, we well, big developer really cash poor. exactly because it's the reality is you know i'm always trying to squeeze the extra time like look we're about to finish on this i'm going to get the money and we'll, we're going to exchange like you know you're always kind of pillar to post but that's the game yes yeah so with regards to the team that you work with the builders and architects you mentioned is it the same guys you move from project to project they run many project for you or do you have a different teams that work on different projects so Generally speaking, I've got a few different teams, but generally the same people I've been working with in most cases for a long time, whether that be my, um, you know, 
well, yeah, whether that be my architects, whether that be my broker, my solicitor, a lot of them, you know, we've been together for a long time and we, we've grown together. I think, you know, growing with people, supporting people around you. That's why, you know, when I do these podcasts, I wear my friend's branding. So I'm in the two cozy t-shirts. Um, I think that's really important. That being said, I think the concept of our no new friends is also not great that yeah. you do need to grow. And if you do outgrow somebody or if, you know, it's not working, you don't have to stay with them just out of loyalty. You always have to reflect on, okay, is this still making sense? And, you know, recently I've taken on some newer build teams that have been super effective and would use them going forward. Because as you grow and evolve, mm -hmm. so will other people with you as well. And sometimes people move in different directions. Mm -hmm. and that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. And we've got good people that work you while you want to continue that relationship. Exactly. But as you said, always be open to looking at different things. Exactly. Um, look, I really appreciate you taking time out to, to see us today because, you know, some people think we need a visa to come to Birmingham. Yeah. Listen, some really people think, because I'm a South Londoner, some people think I, we even need our passport to leave South London and cross the river. So <laughs> Birmingham's like, yeah, I've taken a flight. I'm, I'm, it's, it's been good. I really it's been appreciate it. Oh, what's the what's the best way to people reach out and connect with you? How how uh, can people connect? Um, yes, yeah, so if you want to connect with me, um, it's property by Kazi, all one word. That's across all platforms: um, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, um, Kazim Ali Balogan on LinkedIn. Now, generally, I use Instagram as the best form of contact. Um, you know, if you want to get involved in any of the stuff that we're doing, you know, we've got the links, you know, the link tree there. So whether that be the community, whether that be any consultations, you can reach out to me directly. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you having me on today. You're most welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>